بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم yeah it, it is really uh, i mean it is really remarkable that just this this re- reference that I, I, I don't you know it's so easy to to not notice that allah says that we've sent down iron um and then you discover the iron in fact is sent down and it's not organically produced by earth it just blows your mind okay surah al-jathiyah al-jathiyah jatha means to to kneel and jathiyah is a reference to those who are on their knees on their knees when it's in the hereafter Surah Jasiya is one of these surahs that has kept me up at night and keeps me up at night quite often um, for reasons that I will share with you. It's It takes you forward, puts you in that moment of the moments after resurrection as if a journey into the future that all of us will face delivering a message that is very powerful and truly transformative So first some some uh technical uh material uh in the tradition you'll find that there were competing names for the surah uh so there are some reports that tell us that ijathia um was also called sharia by some sources it was also called al-dahr by some sources but ultimately these proposed names for the surah did not survive there were not the the uh the, the one that sort of won the day and what won the day was the title of jasia when did that ex- exactly happen we don't know but we do know that eventually um Muslims reach a consensus that the most appropriate title for the surah is jathiyah did the prophet ali sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself call it jathiyah you know of course if you have other proposed titles for the same surah like sharia um and al-dahr and we'll see why the, these were proposed it's it sort of gives you pause as to whether in fact it was muslims a, a sort of a, a, a muslim consensus the 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 collective memory of muslims that settled on the title of the surah uh, or um so in other words it's harder to believe that it's a prophet that named them if they named the surah if they were competing names for the surah and i think personally i think that the title of jasia is far more consistent with the message delivered by the surah than sharia or al uh surah jasia is the only surah in the quran in which there's a an explicit reference to sharia which we'll talk about and it also uses the word al dahr wa la yuhlikna illa al dahr but the core message of the surah is far more consistent with the name ajathia or those who are on their knees than the other competing titles the surah is part of a group of surah 
a group of chapters that are known as the Hawamim. Why are they known as the Hawamim? They're known as the Hawamim because it begins with Ha-Mim. In fact, it is the six in, in a series of seven surahs that begin with Hawamim. In the Quran, there are 29 surahs that begin with Ha-Mim. What is the meaning of Hamim? That's a far more, that's a bigger issue, and that's that, that's sort of a complex, complicated uh, thing. But it's worth noting that at the most basic level, we we know that there are surahs that begin with Hamim. There are surahs that begin with um, Alif Lam Ra, and there are there is a surah that begins with um, Noon. And if you take these letters together, they spell Ar-Rahman. So, Hamim, Alif, Lam, Ra, and Noon, they spell the word Ar-Rahman. Is that why you have these letters like Hamim at the beginning of the surah? Again, that's a, that's a much bigger issue. Um, to just wet your appetite there is also a very long discourse as to whether Hamim or Alif Lam Ra uh, has to do with the language of the jinn um, and the language used by uh, Sulaiman Salam Solomon anyway but at the most basic level you should know that you know Alif Lam Ra, Hamim and Noon spell out Ar-Rahman Okay, so Surah al Jathia was revealed in Mecca. It was not close to the time of the Hijra in terms of its order of revelation. If I remember correctly, I noted that somewhere. In terms of its order of revelation, it's reported that it was number 65 in revelation. There are some reports that it was number 64. Uh, some reports that it was revealed after a dukhan. Um, but if you take if you accept that report that it was revealed after a dukhan, then it would be number 45 or number 44. Um, we, we're not, to, to sum up all this material, we're not quite sure other than it was among the surah that the transform, transformative surah revealed in Mecca that shaped the attitude of early Muslims, before they would migrate to Medina, um, we know there is evidence that it was revealed after the migration to Abyssinia by um, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib and other Muslims, that they were not aware of Surat al-Jasiyah when they went to Abyssinia, that it was revealed in their, in, in their absence. So in other words, it was revealed after they went to Abyssinia. Um, But what we can all comfortably say is that it was revealed in Mecca, and so it's a Meccan surah. And we will see why this discussion is important because of a single ayah uh, in Surah Al-Jasiyah that some have said was revealed in Medina. I'm always very skeptical about these reports that one ayah was revealed in Medina and the rest of the surah was revealed in Mecca. But we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. So it starts, Tanzilu kitabi min Allah al-Aziz al-Hakim. Oh, and before I, I proceed, remember, you know, I, I 
I thank all those who donated. I did dua for all those who donated. I asked Allah to sincerely reward them. And I asked Allah to sincerely aid them and support them. And if Allah wants this project to proceed to, to help me through the, see the light and help me see through all the confusion that besets human beings because as a human being you're, you're always being torn by so many different demands and so many different things that you want for yourself and people want of you and the true guide is Allah and if you are with Allah, Allah is with you and so you turn to Allah for guidance and say Allah please let me see through everything and do what I'm supposed to do through your guidance. Um, so I prayed for all those who donated, but pray with me especially for that wonderful family um, who had a brother pass away because they, they were the main impetus for me to decide to do Surah Al-Jathiyah today. Okay, Tanzeel al min Allah al-Aziz al-Hakim. So, the surah itself, we notice that it's divided into five main parts. And as I talked about in the past, and hopefully as I hope to, to work through with, with people, um, using or relying on the Surah Al-Fatiha as my main form of dhikr before taking on Surah Al-Jathiyah and living with Surah Al-Jathiyah for as long as I focused on it, um, and this was years ago, of, uh, of course, the parts of Surah Al-Jathiyah... God, what did I do with it? Okay, so we have five main parts to it. There are, it begins with part one, the, the focus on ayatillah. And we'll talk a second, in a second about the, the, the concept of ayat. The signs of Allah alerting early Muslims, turn yourself program yourself to notice the signs. Your existence must be intimately interlinked and interconnected with the signs, with the ayat. I'll even go a step further. If you live an existence in which you are not reading the ayat, then you have strayed from the past. As-Sirat al-Mustaqim that Al-Fatiha talks to us about is anchored in the concept of Ayatullah, the signs. So part one are the signs. Part two, it talks to us about the results of those who ignore the signs, the consequences of ignoring the signs. There is a short reference, like Surah Al-Hadid, and like many surah in the Quran, a short, re short reminder about the Israelites and the people of the book, and I'll, I'll, I'll comment as to why the Quran often will deliver, start out, open up with a core message about your relationship with Allah, your the way you connect to Allah, and then takes us to the past with a quick reference to the past. Past people. And we'll, we'll talk about that. Then it shifts gears with a reference to your past, you, people of Muhammad, your past, and here is where there's a mention of Sharia, 
And with the mention of Sharia, in the same same part, a reference or a a um, a contrast between Sharia living through Sharia and living through Hawa or caprice and whim. Then the final part the result of those who deny and what becomes of them in the day of judgment. So the signs, the ayat, those who ignore the signs, a reminder of the past people, and then the final part, those who deny God and the consequences in the day of judgment. There is a wonderful spiritual connection, if you will, luminous connection between Surah al Jasiyah, like Surah Al Hadid, and the key to the Quran, the Fatha. I mean, in many ways, it is all about the Sirat, and that's really important for us to always remember. It is always about the sirat. When you stand before Allah in every prayer and you say, "Ihdina sirat al mustaqim," these are not words. These are not words. You are begging Allah to take over your life and put you on a path. That path is all encompassing, as we'll talk about. It's everything. I know that we get used to as وَطَلَعَ عَلَيْهُمُ الْأَمَدْ فَقَصَتْ كُلُوبُهُمْ that you know, وَطَلَعَ عَلَيْهُمُ الْأَمَدْ you get used to it you, you just you, you say هِذِنَا الصَّرَاتِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ all the time and it means nothing anymore you, you can even say it while you're thinking about you know what you have to do your homework your job your 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 family but if you wake up and Allah opens your eyes, and Allah sends that light to surround you. When you say, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim, what immediately explodes, explodes in your brain is not just Surah al Hadid, not just Surah al Jasiya, but so many surah that explode simultaneously the moment you say, Ihdina Sirat al Mustaqim. And it sends shivers up your spine. And brings you to your knees. As we'll talk about. It sends shivers up your spine. And brings you to your knees. And as Surah Sajda tells us. What it really then does. It sends you in a state of sujood. Okay. حَمِيم تَنْزِيلُ الْكِتَابِ مِنَ اللَّهِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَكِيمِ Allah that sent the book, the book of utter complete wisdom. إِنَّ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ In the heavens and the earth are the ayat. But Ayatin lil mu'minin, those who truly believe will realize that the heavens and earth are full of the signs, full of the ayat. Wa fi khalqikum, wa ma yabuthu min dabbatin ayatun li qawmin yuqinun. Inside of you and in every created thing, are ayat, but ayat perceived by who? Ayat by perceived by those who have certitude. Those who have yaqeen, there is Islam, there is iman, and there is yaqeen. Islam, iman, and yaqeen. Yaqeen is 
where you have gone beyond the point of belief in probabilities. There, you know, I am not entirely sure, but it's more likely than not that there is resurrection. I am not entirely sure, but it is more likely than not that there is Allah. I'm not entirely sure, but there is more likely than not that there is accountability. This is the middle road. There is utter doubt where you say it's more likely than not that there isn't. There is belief. Belief is where you basically struggle. You, you wrestle. You, you, you're, some days you're at 90%, some days you are at 60%, some days you are at 51%, some days you are 70%. You, you go up and down. And the opposite of doubt, the other opposite polar side of doubt is yaqeen, is certitude. Where now your heart and mind have settled and it's no longer 51%, 60%, 70%, 90% on good days. But the matter has moved on to certitude. What is your path to certitude is the ayat. The ayat, although this part is ignored because we are not educated about our tradition, sadly, but in our tradition, the theologians talk about two Qur'ans. There, are, there, are, there is a Qur'an tadwini and there is Al-Qur'an al-Takwini. Two Qur'ans. Al-Qur'an al-Tadwini and Al-Qur'an al-Takwini. The Qur'an al-Tadwini is this book that is full of the ayat, the signs. That's the transcribed Qur'an. Al-Qur'an al-Takwini the Quran, the other Quran, the, the, is the khalq, is creation. So Rami sent me a, a message. He had gone on a trip on nature and he was talking about how he watched nature and he saw the ayat. And the minute I read his message, I remembered the entire theological discourse on a Quran at taqwini what Rami was reading was a Qur'an, but a living Qur'an in creation. Those who develop yaqeen learn to read the two Qur'ans and they are intimately connected with the two Qur'ans. Al Imam al-Ghazali, Hamid al-Ghazali, in his Ihya, says something very beautiful about the relationship between a Qur'an al-Takwini and a Qur'an al-Tadwini, which I'll alert you to in a second, but just keep that in mind. Okay. So, the signs are in the heavens and in the earth and in yourself and in everything that Allah creates. The signs lead you to yaqeen, to a certitude. And certitude allows you to live with the signs. You exist within the signs. You yourself become a living sign of the divine. You see human beings and what they do in life is a sign of a, the, the demonic. What they do in life is a sign of the demonic. I'm sure all of us have met people like that. They are an ayah for shaitan. They, what, what, the, what they, the way they treat other human beings or even treat themselves, you know, alcohol or drugs or whatever, has become a living sign for the demonic. But 
where beauty lies, where beauty is, is the aspiration of becoming an ayah in ayatillah, to become a living sign of the divine. A sign of beauty. What you say, what you do, represents Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Represents Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the compassionate, the merciful. That is why when I find, you know, I am in, I, I I can't tell you like how many Islamic centers and Islamic camps I was kicked out of, right? Every time I'm kicked out, there's someone who's yelling at me, and I look at them, and I wonder if they realize the extent to which at this moment that they're yelling and screaming and kicking me out, they are not a sign of the divine. They might think they're protecting Allah's religion. They might think that they're fighting, you know, what, you know that they're standing up for what they believe is a straight path. But that action is not beautiful. That behavior is not beautiful. And any behavior is not that is not beautiful cannot be an ayah in ayatullah. When I see animals suffering, do you see an ayah in ayatullah or do you see an ayah in ayat shaitan? When you see wasteful destruction of nature, do you see ayah in ayatullah or do you see an ayah in ayat shaitan? When you see human beings cheat on each other, each other, lie to each other, oppress each other, imprison each other, assault each other. Do you see an ayah in ayatullah or an ayah in ayat shaitan It is transformative. You want to understand why our forefathers created a civilization, understand how the Quran transformed their being, their consciousness. واختلاف الليل والنهار وما أنزل الله من السماء من رزق فأحيا به الأرض بعد موتها وتصريف الرياح آيات لقوم يعقلون. So the way that life on this earth is meticulously measured between night and day. Between a relationship between the, 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 the heavens, the sky, and earth. Now we know about the ozone layer, for instance. But we didn't back then. But that's what Allah is talking about. There is an intricate measure that sustains existence on this earth. Once that me- if that measure was not intricately sustained, existence would fall apart. So Allah constantly reminds us when people think that when Allah say وَمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مِنْ رِزْقِ that Allah is it's talking about you know the risk of what Allah gave you as as money and as riches and as wealth that, that's not what Allah is talking about what Allah is talking about is that there is an intricate relationship between the skies the the the, the the heavens, uh, uh, what do you call it? There's a word I'm, I'm, I'm missing for. Uh, b- between the, the sun, the moon, the, 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 what we see when we look upwards. And that relation, for ins- instance, as Allah reminds us repeatedly elsewhere, is represented by rain. The fact that rain forms from the, from the, in the sky, falls on earth, and that results, that produces results like rivers and streams, and and agriculture and growth and life and winds and if you reflect upon that the intricacy of sustaining existence you notice the ayat and if you notice the ayat that's your path to certitude I had one of my teachers, Allah would give us part of our homework, is that we had to walk outside of Cairo, 
back then take transportation, which was horrible, but you know, unless we could find some of the students who had cars to, to for, all, for all of us to pack in. Anyway, part of his assignment is that we'd go out to the desert and spend an hour just staring at, at space, staring at sky. He used to say that a person who doesn't look at nature or who forgets to look at nature, or who has been engulfed by life, urban life, so much so that they no longer have a relationship with nature, cannot be a spiritually healthy human being. It was his firm belief that regardless of how much you pray, and or how much you fast, or what, how much you read the Quran, if you do not read the Quran al-Kawni, the Quran of creation, your Iman is flawed. After all these years, I mean, when I was young, his exercises used to annoy me because there, there was a, there were a hassle. You know, you, you have to go out and, and sit there. And, but in retrospect, he was very wise. And I think he was right. Okay. تلك آيات لا نتلوها عليك بالحق فبأي حديث بعد الله وآياته يؤمنون. We remind you of the ayat. What can possibly persuade them other than this discourse about the ayat الله? Notice the way that the Quran in this transformative surah. Surah Al-Jathiyah, is shaping the consciousness of those believers to have an intimate relationship with existence, not to have them isolate themselves as hermits in monasteries where they hide from life and they no longer see creation, but it alerts them to see creation from, the, from a different perspective, from a perspective of a living Qur'an. Okay. فَبِأَيْ حَدِيثٍ بَعْضَ اللَّهِ وَآيَاتِهِ يُؤْمِنُونَ وَيْلٌ لِكُلِّ أَفَّاكٍ أَثِيمٍ يسمع آيات الله تتلى عليه ثم يصر مستكبرا كأن لم يسمعها فبشره بعذاب أليم. So now we get in ayah eight. It suddenly surprises us, or it shifts gear and alarms us about those who are consistently oblivious. To ayatillah, to the signs of Allah. Why is this person in this 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 um, hypothetical person, if you will, the afak, the athim, the liar, as the Quran describes that person, and afak is a liar. Why is this person? Does this person deny the signs of God? The answer that comes from the Quran is out of arrogance. It doesn't mean that everyone that will deny the signs of God will deny it out of arrogance. But the person that, or the type, the topology that the Quran is addressing in this context are those who deny the signs of God out of arrogance, out of an inflated sense of ego. In the tradition, we are told that there was an occasion for this specific revelation 
that when the Quran talks about wailun li kulli affakin athim yasma'u ayatin la yutla alayhi thumma yusurru mustakbiran that that, that it, woe to that to the liar who arrogantly ignores the ayat Allah, the signs of God that there was a man called Al-Mudar bin Al-Haris and Al-Mudar bin Al-Haris was um, was an interesting figure <laughs> um he hated Muslims but was very distressed by the attention and the impact that the Quran was having in Mecca. Even those who refused to follow Muhammad would still describe the Quran as a magical book with a magical language. And as we know from the tradition that they say it's not poetry, it's not magic, it's not anything we've been exposed to before, but we Arabs who know poetry know that this is remarkably eloquent and remarkably powerful. So Anwadar bin al Haris traveled to Persia and to Sham and would collect what were described as stories, narratives, mythology told by storytellers in Persia and in Sham and he brought it back to Mecca and he wanted to he, he positioned these stories as worthy of more attention than the Quran. So he, as the story goes, is that he goes to the Kaaba and he says, people, I have brought you something better than the Quran. I have brought you something that is worthy. You know, forget that Quran. Listen to these stories I brought from Persia and I brought from Syria. These stories trump the Quran. Um, and as the reports say, that when, that the Quran responds to him by describing him as an arrogant human being who refuses to see the signs. Now, was there a Nudar bin al Haris? Probably yes. Did he in fact go and collect um, stories from Persia and so on and try to argue that they are more worthy of attention than the Quran? Probably yes. Did the Quran respond to Nudar bin al Haris? Absolutely. Because it responded to the critics of Muhammad and the critics of the Quran in numerous situations. Can we say with absolute confidence that this part of Surah al Jasiyah is responding to Nur bin al Haris? No, we can't. Scientific accuracy and honesty compels me to tell you that this is what many traditions say. However, it's a complicated picture because we also have many reports that know what response to the Nudra bin al Haris are other ayat in other surah. Um, there is, if we track down when in Nudra bin al Haris existed, when was he likely that he traveled to Persia and came back to Mecca with his stories? And then we try to match that with when was Surah al Jasiyah revealed, things don't match up that well. The events of Al Nudar bin al Haris seem to have taken place after Surah al Jasiyah was revealed. But Allahu Alam, you know, anyway. But, you know, that doesn't affect 
the meaning itself. That more often than not, more often than not, it is the human ego that prevents you from opening your heart to the Quran al Tadwini and al Quran al Kauni, to the written Quran and the created Quran. Okay. Then this the Quran in 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 its unique style that that sort of shifts gears and and grabs your attention. Hada Huda. After talking about those who ignore the signs of God, then it says, Hada Huda. This is guidance. If you're reading the Quran with your heart and you're paying attention, it sort of like slaps you in your face and you wake up. Hada Huda. This is guidance. وَالَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ مِنْ رِشْسٍ أَلِيمٌ. This is the truth. Now, those who deviate from that path, they will suffer the consequences. الله الذي سخر لكم البحر لتجري الفلك فيه بأمره والتي يبتغوا من فضله ولعلكم تشكرون. I am at ayah number twelve, by the way, just in in case you're following. Allah has facilitated. Has do you know like the way you 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 go into a house and you set it up so that you can live in it. You bring in the bed, you bring in the couches, you bring in the curtains, you bring in the air conditioner, you bring in whatever you you know the uh, amenities. In the same way, Allah reminds us: if you look at the earth, you look at the seas, you look at the mountains, you will realize that this was set up, this was organized. Methodically and purposefully for your living. That whether you look at what flies in in the sky or what exists in the seas or what treads upon the earth, it was all furnished for you purposely. And it is thinking people. Now, thinking, yatafakkarun, reflecting people with the message that an istikbar, arrogance, egoism, will stand as an obstacle to the process of reflection. It is reflecting people that understand this. Now, what comes next? قُلْ لِلَّذِينَ يُؤَمَنُوا يَغْفِرُوا لِلَّذِينَ لَا يَرْجُونَ أَيَّامَ اللَّهِ لِيَجْزِي قَوْمًا بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ أَسَاءَ فَعَلَيْهَا ثُمَّ إِلَى رَبِّكُمْ تُرْجَعُونَ this is ayah 14 and 15. So what comes after that? Tell those who believe, those who in fact see the signs, those who have reflected and understood, to do what? To forgive those who do not see, who do not understand. What comes with this forgiveness? The understanding that each of you is responsible for you and you alone. If you do good, it's for you. And if you don't, it's against you. 
Now, this part of Surah Jasiya, again, it's one of these things that is shaping the moral relationship that a Muslim has with the world. Understand the fact that there are those who don't see the signs, those who don't follow the guidance, those who whose ego stands in the way of their understanding, those who are unable to reflect the way that the believers reflect. What is your what is your attitude towards them? Forgive. Now, in Imam Al Ghazali in Ihya Alum al Din, when he talks about the Quran al Taqwini and the Quran al Tadwini, he says that those who study the two Qurans, the, the written Quran and the created Quran, will understand that because Allah made, facilitated, everything for human life, furnished existence for human beings to live on this earth. What a human being will learn from that reflection and that awareness is that whether we like it or not, Allah has honored human beings and dignified human beings. And when you learn that Allah has honored human beings, and if you truly understand the ayat Allah, the signs of Allah, your attitude towards those who fail to see the signs cannot be but forgiveness. In fact, Imam al-Ghazali goes beyond and says, cannot be but sympathy or empathy. You feel bad that they don't see what you see. This, this part of Surah Jasiya produced a discourse that I have to tell you about. Again, for the sake, because I, you know, this is a spiritual journey, but also I'm, I'm a scholar, so, uh, you know, I can't cheat you. I have to tell you what the... There are those who insisted that this ayah, قُلْ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا يَغْفِرُوا لِلَّذِينَ لَا يَرْجُونَ أَيَّامِ اللَّهِ لِيَجْزِلْ قَوْمًا بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ وَمَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا فَلِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ أَسَاءَ عَلَيَا ثُمَّ إِلَى رَبِّكُمْ تُرْجَعُونَ That these two ayahs were revealed in Medina while the rest of Surah Al-Jasiyah was revealed in Mecca. What is interesting is that those who said it was revealed in Medina, they also said that this is why these two ayahs were not abrogated. You might be saying, hold on, what are you talking about? Abrogated. This is because some scholars said that yes, this ayah about forgiving those who don't don't have understanding of ayyam Allah, and we'll talk about ayyam Allah in a second those who don't have who don't, those who don't see the signs was abrogated after the hijrah to Medina so Muslims should no longer forgive this is the argument from Nasr. In response, there are those then who said, no, no, these two ayahs were not abrogated because in fact they were revealed in Medina. Something happened to this TV. Are we still okay?
a, a minor devil attack. We're, okay, you're back. Okay. So those who said it's revealed in Medina, it's abrogated. Those who said no, it was revealed in Me- sorry, it was revealed in Mecca and abrogated. Those who said no, it's revealed in Medina and not abrogated. And then those those who said, well, it was revealed in Mecca, yes, but it's not abrogated. I think the argument that these two ayahs were abrogated is ridiculous. I think it's a very convoluted argument and it's a politically oriented argument. But which, which is most fascinating and what must give you pause here. So tell those who believe, the mu'mineen, those who have seen the signs, to forgive those who la yarjuna ayyam illa those who have despaired of ayyam illa now you have to pause here what is this expression ayyam illa the days of god it doesn't say those who have despaired in the signs of god it doesn't say those who have despaired in the hereafter. It doesn't say those who ha- don't believe in God. It says those who have despaired in the days of God. I've prayed and prayed and prayed on Ayyamillah. My heart told me that there is something that the, this expression, these two words, ayam illah, the days of God, conceals a meaning that I long to understand. And what my journey led to is the understanding that in the same way that there is temporal time, there is divine time. If you want to say divine time exists in a different dimension, so be it. Remember in Surah Al-Hadid, when Allah tells us that what you consider to be a day, or what you consider to be a thousand years, is a day in Allah's time. That when Allah created the heavens and the earth in six days, these are not days like your days. What is fundamentally flawed about those who cannot see the signs is that they cannot see beyond this material dimension with its physicality. When they see a couch, they see a couch. They don't see that a couch is just an energy field. It's an illusion. The microphones are energy fields, and they're an illusion. The only thing that when you perceive with your heart that is not an illusion is Allah. Similarly, and this is where it's important, your relationship with time, you can sit and you do tasbih and you feel every second of it. It's boring. It's boring. Okay, I've done 33 Allahu Akbar, I've done 33 Alhamdulillah, I've done 33 Subhanallah. Oh, okay, now I can go play, go back to my video games. <laughs> you can do that. But that's a yamil insan, that's human time. How do you experience divine time? 
You can only experience it. You cannot describe it. A rak'ah is not a rak'ah. A sajda is not a sajda. When you do tasbih, the passage of half an hour and an hour is not felt like half an hour and an hour. It is a different experience. Now, you might not experience it, but you might humbly believe. I am not aware of all existence just because I exist in the material world. I I know, I am humble enough to realize that in the same way there was existence before I came to the world, and in the same way existence will continue after I die, and in the same way that I don't know how time will be after I'm resurrected, and in the same way that in in the dimension of the divine, where angels dwell, and where also demons dwell, time is a different experience altogether. Okay, I was tempted for a second to to tell you something freaky, but Grace is cheering. No, I think that will... Do it. Okay. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, what they call a spectral manifestation, a ghost. (laughs) What you see, the reason they appear and disappear so quickly is that the way that they experience time, for them to appear for a second or half of a second, they have to perform the deed that they do at a different time dimension than your own. That is why their appearance is so fleeting. You can even capture them on camera, this type of jinn, that you, you can capture them on film, and people do capture them on film. But they never sustained prolonged existence because we are on different time dimensions. There are numerous things in our existence that if the, you have the humility, you realize the extent to which you don't know and you don't understand. And that then opens the past to a relationship with Allah because the only constant and stable thing that you can hope for in this existence is Allah. If you don't have that humility and you presumptuously say, well, it can't be. The material world is all there is. You strip yourself of any true spirituality. Ayyam Allah, by the way, is also the experience of time in the hereafter. And we'll get there in one second. Okay. Then the reference to the Israelites. You might wonder, well, why the reference to the Israelites in this context? Why does the Quran often, whenever it talks about the ayat, it always ref- references the past? Well, at one level, and this is typical of the Quranic style, among the ayat Allah is history. It's alerting you that the signs of God don't just exist in a text. They don't just exist in creation as experienced at, at a contemporaneous moment, but also in studying history and studying the past. And if we study history and we study the past, what do we learn about the Israelites? فَمَا اخْتَلَفُوا إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَهُمُ الْعِلْمُ بَغْيًا بَيْنَهُمْ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ يَقْضِي بَيْنَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فِيمَا كَانُوا فِيهِ خَلِفُونَ This is Ayah 17. Okay, so the Israelites were blessed. They were blessed because at a time 
when humanity had completely lost the message that the Prophet Abraham brought, the monotheism of the Prophet Abraham, and humanity had completely lost it. The Israelites became the bearers at one time of monotheism. They preserved the message of monotheism to humanity. And from a Muslim perspective, they also preserved the message of the coming of the Prophet Muhammad, that they were, they were alerted that there will be a final prophet that, br- that brings the message of monotheism. Anyway, so what went wrong? And here notice the relationship of this to the mention of Sharia. The Israelites disagreed amongst each other. Is the problem that they disagreed? Is the problem is that they differed with one another or argued with one another? That was not the problem. The problem is that they did so for egotistical reasons. Baghyan baynahum. Not for out of sincere reasons, not out of scientific reasons. They didn't really disagree about the law as law. It became a battle between different rabbis and their egos. Different rabbinic authorities insisted on their positions because This rabbi sought prestige, and that rabbi sought prestige, and the followers of that rabbi wanted prestige for their rabbi, and the followers of that rabbi wanted prestige for their rabbi. It is alerting us to something, to a danger that the Quran will often alert us to. That it is a blessing to be given the the law of God. It is a blessing to be given the path of God. But it comes with a heavy, very heavy responsibility. That if the law of God becomes a vehicle for wrestling, egotistical wrestling matches, then there is also, it could become the medium for going astray. So let's take this back to the way I use myself as an example because that's the only intimate example that I know and with other people that I might have known here and there about different sorts. But anyway, but take this to your own life experiences. What is among the most jarring experiences that we all have with God's law? It is arrogant imams who talk on behalf of God as if they are privy to the divine will And they do so where you feel that their knowledge of the Quran or their knowledge of the fiqh or their knowledge of whatever their knowledge is has become an exercise in ego. So I'm talking about the experience where, you know, for instance, someone wrote me and said, you know, they're telling me it's haram to be a vegetarian. Or you go somewhere and, you know, they're, they're fixing your scarf for you. Or they're telling you how you should sit, or what you, how you should look, or how, and you feel that they're not doing it because they love you, or out of true humility. They're doing it because it's an egotistical exercise. What has plagues our Muslim ummah today? What plagues our Muslim ummah is. We're all jealous of each other. We're all envious of each other. When some, we, we all use God's knowledge 
in order for bragging rights over each other. When we do that, we become the Israelites. We become the Israelites. I often withdraw from Islamic centers and Islamic conferences when I get invited to go to an Islamic conference in this country or that country, I don't. Because of these ayahs. Because if knowledge of fiqh is going to be an exercise in, look at me, I am privy to Allah's law, I am sheikh such and such, I am, you know... It, it is, I have a visceral allergic reaction to it. Allah's law should never become that. The minute I find, you know, when I meet a lot of imams, immediately I feel like they're on guard with me. Like, you know, I don't want to concede that you know more than me or you know as much as me. So I'm going to give you an attitude that first defines our power relations. Do you know what I do? I withdraw. I say, fine. This is your playing field. This is your space. I'm gone. I'm not going to fight with you. I'm not going to compete with you. Because that is the biggest haram. I'm not going to flex authority. I'm not going to try to win your followers to my side. I withdraw. And if you follow the path, if for whatever it's worth, if my past is of any use to you, I would advise you to do the same. Don't ever allow the law of God to become a vehicle either to, to pump your ego or to flex your authority over others. That is a serious haram. Okay. Now, ثُمَّ جَعَنَّاكَ عَلَى شَرِيعَةٍ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ فَاتَّبِعْهَا وَلَا تَتَّبِعْ أَهْوَاءَ الَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Here is where the mention of sharia in the Quran. ثُمَّ جَعَنَّاكَ عَلَى شَرِيعَةٍ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ We've given you a righteous path. That righteous path contrasted with what? With the capricious attitudes or with the whims of human beings. So I don't forget anything, just let me check. Okay. And if you want to walk that righteous path, your alliances and your affiliation must be clear. Of Zalimun Awliya'um um sorry ba'dum awliya ubad those who are inequitous those who tread the path of egoism and arrogance those who will imitate the behavior of the israelites where their disagreements will be led by prestige and authority. This is not the Sharia. Regardless of how much it might camouflage as Sharia. But moreover, and I'll tell you, in my relationship with it, anything that leads to cruelty, anything that leads to lack of mercy, 
Anything that leads to suffering cannot be a part of the Sharia. It is part of dhulm, of injustice. And it is the... I mean, it is the just, unjust that support each other in the same way that it is the just who support each other. So what it's saying is, when you create your associations in life, how do you engineer your space? You engineer your space by filling that space with pure and beautiful things. So in other words, your associations must be associations of justice. It is nonsense if you want to be a beautiful human being, if you want to be a person that sees the ayat, a person who walks the path of sharia, you can't surround yourself with ugliness. You can't surround yourself with nasty human beings or nasty friends or nasty acquaintances and then say, well, why is it I'm ha having such a hard time finding God? You are, I mean, the Prophet has uh, uh, so many hadiths on this point. I'm not, you know, for instance, when, when uh, the Prophet says that he, he, you are with you are your what your companionship are if if your companion is not good they either burn you at or at the minimum they slime you like like the um, what do you call that the soot of fire it either burns you or it tars you with the soot the same concept here but the critical thing is we often forget that unless you purify your time space and you purify your physical space, your path to Allah will become very difficult. One of the first things I do is that I look at the space where I will worship. And I want the space not to be invaded by anything that is impure. I want to control the time in that space and I want to control the physicality of that space so that it is occupied in that space, even if that space is a corner in a room, is occupied by nothing but what is angelic and what is divine. I want to experience the angels in that space. And I recognize that even my cell phone can be a distraction. So my cell phone is never in that space. Well, my cell phone is never in any space because I don't use my cell phone. But that's, a, uh, that's an aside. But we often forget this and we often ignore this. We often think that we can have our time and our physical space, our time space and our physical space, polluted. But yet somehow it doesn't affect us. That is in itself arrogance. Because you arrogantly think that you are stronger than you are and that you are more autonomous than you are. But in reality, we as human beings we are deeply affected by our environment. If you spend a lot of time on the web being exposed to toxic things, that toxicity will affect you. It, w whether these toxic things are Islamophobia or any other toxic things, it will affect you. You can't pretend it doesn't. It's all, it's about your ego, your humility. If after all these years of study and all the degrees I have, and you know, all, I readily admit that I 
I could be easily influenced by the toxicity that would invade my physical space and my time space, I think it would probably hold true for other people as well. Okay. So, before moving on in Surah Al-Jasiya to its, its pent ultimate, like its main message, all of this is not the main message of Surah Al-Jasiya. All of this is a, a narrative getting to the main point. I should t- just tell you quickly that there are um, other narratives, there are other reports about occasions of revelation. One of them, if you open up books of Tafsir, it will tell you about it, that the, uh, the, um, that when Muslims were out on one of their military campaigns, Um, that the head of the hypocrites in Medina, um, uh, what's his name, Ibn Ubay, sent out his boy to get water. And he goes to a well, comes back, and he doesn't have water. So Ibn Ubay says to, to that boy, that servant boy, why didn't you get, why didn't you fill water? fill a flask with water. And he said, because the prophet has assigned, appointed a guard to guard the water well during this military campaign, and that guard told that servant kid, I don't remember the servant kid's name, um, wait for your turn, because we are first having the uh, soldiers fill their flasks with water before the non-soldiers can fill their flasks with water. So in other words, you know, go back in the line because those who are mili- filling up their water for military purposes or those who are in the getting ready for battle will fill water first. So the boy didn't want to wait and he went back to Ibn Ubay the, the head of the hypocrites, and he told them, you know, they wouldn't let me fill water because they said I have to wait till all the military guys fill water. And then Ibn Ubay said uh, a statement that is often repeated in many sources, oh, these Muslims are like dogs, we're, we, we're, the dogs who you feed, or dogs that you feed, and when they become... Um, well fed, they eat you. Now, I don't know what dogs, what type of dogs he had. I've never heard of a dog that is well fed and then because they're well fed, they'll, they'll eat you. They'll, they'll actually bite you and, and consume you. But that's what Ibn Ubay said. Well, of course, what he meant by that, he wants to insult Muslims that we, w- we took them in in Medina, we... we um, uh, we fed them, we housed them, we so on, we protected them, and look, now they're bossing us around uh, by telling us when we can fill water from a well and when. Now, probably the incident took place, but did that incident necessarily take place with Surat al-Jasiyah? And was because of that incident that Allah revealed Um, that Allah talked about those who don't aspire for the days of God or those who don't aspire for a comprehension of the days of God? Was Allah referring to Ibn Ubay? Well, then that would make the revelation Medinian. And that's not consistent with all the reports that tell us that this revelation is Meccan. Moreover, there is a mismatch between the Quran talking about the days of God and this particular incident with Ibn Ubay. 
So I'm telling you this to tell you that I don't believe that that was an occasion of, for revelation. There is another report that says that there was a man called um, Finhas, uh, who uh, a, a, a Jew that lived in Medina, and Finhas told Sa Omar ibn al Khattab, and he told Omar ibn al Khattab, Your God is poor and we're rich. We don't need God because we have money, but. You're, and this was, it's an interesting sidebar, but anyway. Uh, um, and then Omar ibn Khattab was, was deeply offended and wanted to go after Finhas and kill him. When the Prophet ﷺ finds out about this, he orders Omar to step down and says, you know, forgive them. They don't know any better. Uh, they don't have an understanding of ayyam Allah, of the days of God. Did that event take place? Probably. But did it take place about in, in the context of Surah al -Jasiyah? Probably not. Because again, it would make it Medinian. And we have, and that doesn't sit well with all the reports that Surah al -Jasiyah was Meccan. But even if Surah al -Jasiyah was Medinian, was ayyam Allah revealed to address Finhas and his statement? Probably not, because there is another surah that actually, that was probably revealed in the context of the Finhas controversy that we don't need to get into now. I'm just telling you this so that, to complete the picture, but I don't believe that any of these reports drive with, as an occasion for revelation, with Surah Tijasiyah. In fact, what I believe that Surah Tijasiyah was a Meccan revelation intended to shape and engineer the psychology, the epistemology, and the consciousness of early Muslims. Okay. Now, it goes on to talk about Then it goes on to talk about those who worship their whim rather than worship God, that their true guide is their whim, their capricious, their, their, their impulses. إِلَاهُ هِعَوَاهُ وَأَضَلَّهُ اللَّهُ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ And so on and so forth. That once you fall in the trap of your ego guiding you rather than a state of discipline where you constantly scrutinize your ego you are you easily slip into that state of blindness where your ego becomes effectively your god and your impulses drive you and you confuse between your impulses and your intellectual ideas in life, I've seen that so many times. I've seen so many people, it's not that they go through an intellectual journey where the intellectual journey, for instance, ends up convincing them that there is nothing wrong with consuming alcohol or with having fornicating and so on or it's rather the other way around. I've seen this time and time again. A, a woman meets a man that she likes. She weakens. She starts having sex with that man. Or the other way, a man meets a woman that he likes, starts having sex with that woman. Or a person starts weakening and starts drinking alcohol and having done that, rationalizing backwards about, well, do we really know what God's will is? Do we really know what the ayat Allah are? Do we really know what the Quran says? Is the Quran really clear? 
I've seen that time and time again. And there is no point arguing. There's no point arguing. Because the intellectual argument is a camouflage. The intellectual argument conceals a whim. You, if you really wanted to talk to them, you talk to them, I mean, in the same way that I've seen that time and time and again in my life, there are a few times in life where there are people who have gone down this path and then things happened in their life where they come back crying, broken, and say, okay, I admit it. I doubt, I stopped praying, I stopped fasting, I, st- I doubted because I was in love. I mean, I'm actually talking about a real life experience. I was in love with this woman and I just thought my whole world centered around her and, you know, she was my girlfriend, we lived together and so on and so forth. And then I, she just left me for another man and I'm completely crushed and I want to go back to Allah. I've seen that. And suddenly, I mean, I'm actually talking about a guy who used, who majored in philosophy at Harvard And I stopped arguing with him because I realized that all his philosophical arguments wanted to justify a lifestyle where he's living with this woman. But then when she left him, suddenly he comes back and it's like, oh yes, okay, fine. All all these hours that, you know, I was much younger then, so I also had more energy and so on. uh, Of of arguing, all, all these philosophical arguments, okay, fine, I admit I'm broken now, I want Allah. And you're the only one that I know that can, that has, you know, can you take me back to Allah? I've seen that not as often as I've seen the other thing, but <laughs> the path to rational intellectual arguments is not always a sincere and honest path. It, uh, it, often it, it's a camouflage for a psychological flaw and a psychological weakness. I mean, if you've ever read Freudian philosophy, I've, I'm convinced Freud had serious psychological problems. And his entire writing and all his, I mean, although he's a very good writer, but all his, all his psychology... <laughs> is basically spewing, vomiting of his own psychological problems on, in, a, in a scholarly fashion on pages. Okay, moving on. So that's the ilaha hawa in, in, in verse 23. وَقَالُوا مَا هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا نَمُوتُ وَنَحْيَا وَمَا يُهُلِكُنَا إِلَّا الدَّارِ وَمَا لَهُمْ بِذَلِكْ مِنْ عِلْمٍ إِنْهُمْ إِلَّا يَظُمُّونَ Okay, so now the surah is starting to gear up to its conclusion, to its penultimate statement. Those whose attitude is that if you believe in a hereafter, it cannot be ba'dhan. Remember we talked about yaqeen, certitude. Here is the dhan, where basically their attitude is even those who believe in Allah and in a resurrection and in the hereafter, you know, they don't really know. No one can really know. How many of us have heard that? No one can really know. Can you really be sure that Allah exists? Can you really be sure that there is accountability and there is a resurrection? One can only suspect that there is, but not anything beyond that. Those who said that the surah should be called Surah Al-Dahr comes from this ayah. وَمَا يُهُلِكُنَا إِلَّا الدَّهْرِ 
Because this is the only place where the Quran uses that word dahr. The only thing that we really can count on, the only thing that we know for sure is that we will die because of temporal time. That earth time will pass and we will age and we will die. That is the only thing we can be certain of. As to anything beyond that, we're not really sure. Notice the way that the Quran anticipates everything that will take place in your psychology. Anticipates what you will be and what you are and what you will tell yourself. How many, how often have you heard in your life that precise attitude that it is only time, earth time, that we experience and that we know about. Anything beyond that, well, you know, we can sort of believe, but we're not really sure. Your path to yaqeen, your path to reaching that point where it is no longer a question, where you, where you see, where you see non-temporal time, where you experience divine time, in other words, you experience the dimensions beyond this dimension. Are ayatullah, the ayat that are written and the ayat that are created. Okay. ولله ملك السماوات والأرض ويوم تقوم الساعة يوم إذن يخسر المطلون. Now we're gearing up to the penultimate statement. وترى كل أمة جاثية كل أمة تدعى إلى كتابها اليوم تجزون بما كنتم تعملون. هذا كتابنا ينطق عليكم بالحق إن كنا نستنسخ ما كنتم تعملون After taking you on this journey talking to you about the ayat talking to you about the past learning from history learning from the present the existence of dimensions of time. Talking to you about the Sharia, the path of God. What could go wrong with the path of God? Talking to you about the nature of certitude contrasted with doubt and the lack of certitude. Then it deliver, if you will, the punch. What is the the major jolt? It carries you to the final day and gives you a jarring picture of the final day. What is that jarring picture? You will find every ummah, jathia, on its knees. You will find every ummah on its knees. And every ummah is being called to its book. If you are praying on this ayat, you would pause and say, wait, every ummah, why is an ummah on its needs? We're not talking about individuals, we're talking about ummahs now. Why every ummah? And what is that image? They're not in sujood, they're on their knees. Especially when Ayat al says, Here 
is the book? The book. What did the book do? Nastansikh. Nastansikh, which is a remarkable expression. Ma kuntum ta'amaloon. Okay. Every ummah doesn't mean everyone. Doesn't mean every human being. It means groups of people. Groups of people will come. Why do they fall to their knees? After living with Surah al Jasi and worshipping on it for a very long time. Do you remember when I told you about the dimensions that are not temporal? The image that I saw is that people fall on their knees because they can't stand out of the sheer magnitude of the situation. They will literally, it's not that they, 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 their, knees will, their knees will buckle. That's the expression. Their knees will buckle. And as they're standing there, they will fall to their knees as an expression of your knees shaking and giving way under you. Then there are two parts to this. There is an accountability as an ummah. The Quran already alerted you to this when it talked about the Israelites. You will see your collective record. It's as if a film will be turned on where you will be shown your history your failures and your successes as a people. The injustices. The times that... Imagine if we are being shown in a film of our time and ummah. The colonization of Palestine. The plight of the Kashmiris. The plight of the Bosnians. The plight of the Rohingyas. The plight of the Uyghur Muslims the Palestinian refugees, the loss of Jerusalem, the wealth of the Saudis and the Gulfies, the billions of dollars in Swiss banks and French banks. We will, as an ummah, stand and see that. Here's your track record. Remember the Quran alerted us about the Israelites. You were chosen you were the best ummah given to humankind because you, you, call, you enjoyed the good and forbid the evil. Here is a film of your track record. What do you have to say? But then the other part. could mean we with copy, but that's, that's, that's not enough. Nestensich, literally, in its literal sense, it means we used to keep a copy of everything you do. As if, in our modern language, we used to film everything you do. My relationship with Surah Tijasiya what dawned upon me is the reason it is called Surah Al-Jasiyah. The people, we and all people, will, their knees will buckle. Is you will be shown a film of your life. What we modern call a film. You will be shown your sins. You will see your sins. When the Quran talks about your hands testifying against you and your legs testifying against you, for the pre-moderns, 
what, what does that mean? Okay, my hand will grow lips and talk? My legs will grow lips, will talk? What if what the Quran was talking about is that you will see your hands, you will see your body like a, uh, what do you call that thing, um, with, with the, a project an image? Uh, what do you call that? Hologram. hologram. What if you will see a hologram of your life, of your sins? You will see it. You will see the ugliness of what you've done. You've beat someone. You've cursed someone. You've yelled at someone. You've degraded someone. You will see it. That's why you will judge yourself. You, oh my God, if you've killed someone, you will see it. If you've made people suffer, you will see it. There will be no way to deny it. Because That's why your knees will buckle. You will see it collectively as an ummah and you will see it individually. It's like a flashback. For us, Surah Tijasiyah, that's why I believe the Quran is a fountain that never ends. The earlier, the, those earlier generations who didn't have our modern technology couldn't really conceive of the way that you keep track of every human being on earth. We today know that Google can do it. Google can keep track of every human being, being on earth and what they do. And we even suspect that whatever you do, there are people spying on you and keeping track of your searches and your net. And, you know, unless you want to go off the grid and go live in it. But with Allah, you can't go off the grid. The penultimate statement in Surah al Jasiyah. The thing that terrifies me about Surah Al-Jasiyah is that it confronts me with something I don't want. I will see every sin I committed, every wrong I've done, vividly, undeniably. No argumentations. It's like a film, a record of what you've done. Here, see it. And that image, that as a result your knees will buckle, if you, if you truly reflect on that, what happens? You run and you do sujood. Allah, please... Save me from that moment. Please don't show me my sins. Please don't show me my un injustices. Please don't show me the ways I made others suffer. Or the ways that I might have hurt others. My God, I remember when I was a teenager and the times that I upset my mother. My mother was a very, very pious and a very, very angelic human being and the ways that I might have broken her heart and the idea that I might be shown myself and the way that I might have spoken to my mother and hurt her terrifies me and it sends you from your knees to a sujood begging Allah to save you from that moment. After taking you to that pinnacle, and that's the main point of Surah al -Jasiyah. That's why you have Surah al -Jasiyah. Then, it takes you back and reminds you that this is not just about fear. This is not just about freaking you out. No. What is this? 
This is ayah number 20. What is this? This is guidance. This is guidance and mercy to people. It's not about terrifying you. It's not about freaking you out. It's about bringing righteousness and goodness and mercy. And about a principle of justice. Uh, The Quran often will take us back to the principle of justice. What is the principle of justice? This is ayah number 21. What is the principle of justice? That those who do good cannot be treated the same like those who do bad. There has to be consequences. It's not all equal. It's not all relative. Because if you treated all people the same, all morality and all meaning and all goodness and all beauty would fall. Look at the way it takes you to the height where you tremble and then it takes you back and tells you, no, this is about mercy. This is about justice. This is about principles. This is about truth. Then the closing. So, does this story have a wrap up, have a concluding paragraph? Yes. The principle of justice dictates. That if you forget ayam Allah, that if you forget divine time, if you ignore accountability, if you forget ayat Allah, if you forget the signs of God, ultimately, if you forget God, then in the hereafter, you will be forgotten as you have forgotten. You forgot God? Well, in the hereafter, you will be forgotten. وَقِيلَ الْيَوْمْ نَنْسَاكُمْ كَمَا نَسِيتُمْ لِقَاءَ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا So, I'm treating you like adults. I'm treating you with the principle of accountability. I'm not giving you some BS story about how I suffered for you and I've sacrificed myself for you and I went and died on some thing or on the cross because of the original sin. No, I'm treating you like adults. Per the principle of justice. If you forget, you will be forgotten. Now, on the other hand, if you want to remember, you will be remembered. And then this magical closing. فَلِلَّهِ الْحَمْدُ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَرَبُّ الْأَرْضِ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ لَهُ كِبْرِيَاءُ فِي السَّمَاءِ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ So the closing of it is thank God, thank the Lord of the heavens of the earth, the Lord of all existence, for the guidance, for the for the journey that we took with Surah Jasiya, that has taken us from awareness, opening our consciousness to Ayatullah, to the realization that we will see our life in, as if in a flashback in the hereafter. Protest, and we will see it collectively as nations and individually as people. And a reminder that this is about righteousness and truth and justice. 
I told you that to every surah there is a tasbih that I follow, that I persist with, so that the surah can, can nest in my heart. And with surah al is فَلِلَّهِ حَمْدُ رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَرَبُّ الْأَرْضِ رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ لَهُ كِبْرِيَاءِ له كبرياء في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم. I repeat it in a state of zikr for as long as it took until I felt that Surah Al-Jasiya has become as a close friend, an intimate companion, not words just in a book. But an intimate companion speaking to me, telling me what the core, what 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 the spirit and heart and soul of the message is. alhamd. And this is Surah Al-Jathia. If you take it to heart, you can't but transform your life. If people just understood nothing they do on this earth will somehow be just swept under a carpet, they will it will they will be confronted with it all, and it's not in some silly, comical, cartoonish way where you have arms speaking and legs speaking. We in the modern age have a capacity to understand what Surah Jathia was talking about. Even before the early, better than the earlier generations. We will see it like a flashback, like a film shown to us. And if that doesn't make your knees, your knees buckle, buckle, then there's something wrong. Okay, let's take five minutes and then we can do Q&A. Okay, I will, I will pray. Yeah.